right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. This is the R for Data Science Online Learning Community, um, R for DS, um, well, R for Data Science Cohort Nine Book Club. Um, today we're gonna be today we're gonna be going over Chapter Three, which is Data Workflow. Oh, wait, actually, let me make sure I got that right. I think it's like basic workflow. And um, Ken Fu is going to be presenting for us. So, yeah, Ken, if you want to start screen sharing. All right. Can you, um, everyone hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. So, we're going to. Um, thank you, Lydia, for the introduction. As um, as mentioned earlier, we're going to be going over chapter three of the R for DS book, where we're talking about workflow basics. So some of the things that we're going to be learning about today would be about understanding the R Studio interface, using the R command line boldly, following good style conventions when writing code, and lastly, how to confidently call functions in R. Okay, so when it comes to R Studio, um, just to recall from last previous chapters, we talked a lot about the basics of how R works as well as data visualization. And before we go on to talk about how to code a little bit more, we also have it's important to know also the layout of R Studio, which is where a lot of the code is done, coding is done. And one of the best ways to get into it is to look at the interface of R Studio. So one of the first Things that you notice about R Studio when you open it is that below on the bottom left right here is the console pane. This is the place where you can type in commands and code and and you'll be able to get immediate output. So for example, I'll demonstrate here with my R Studio. So for example, um, let's say I want to know the result of one plus four. Right. So what you do is you go to this command line here down here type in the command that you want to run, and then you press enter or return, and then it will immediately tell you the results of, of this command that you type. So in this case, one plus four gives you five. So this is a nice quick way that you can run commands, especially for commands that you're not interested in saving. And so it's a pretty convenient way to get results right away. However, uh, while the console is pretty useful to get quick calculations, especially if you want to use R as a sort of a calculator, it doesn't save the commands that you type out. So if you exit our studio, it's gonna forget everything that you typed out. So just as an example, I close down our studio. And if I go back and open it, you will see that it doesn't remember any of the commands that you typed earlier. So I go back to my R studio and you see here it's gone, it's all erased. So that's what happens when you exit our studio. Any commands you typed out are erased, which means that that um, that if you want to save your commands, you you will have to use the scripting interface here, which is another part of the R Studio interface, the script pane, which is on the the top left, and this is where you type out your commands, and you can run them just like how in the console, but unlike the console, you can actually save the, any commands that you type out. So that way, if you want to reuse them, instead of having to type them out all out again, you can save it to a file and be able to open it, you know, whenever. So as an example, I'm going to create a script by going to file, new file, and then R script, and then there's Quarto and R markdown. But just for this example, I'm going to just start with an R script. So I have an R script here. And let's say I want to figure out load a library called the tidyverse, for example. Hold on a second. Or let's say better yet, like let's say I want to know the result of one plus four. And I can run this by going into code and then run selected lines. So basically you highlight the part of the script that you want to run and then you press, you go here to code and then you click run selected lines or just press control enter and then it'll run it for you. So here, I ran one plus four, that gives you five. So any commands that you want to save and reuse, you can always write it in a script 
and save it to a file. So I can go to file, save as, and then I'll just give it a name like test script. Test or like test script, yeah. So that's um, one option if you wanna save your commands. So with that said, there's also other parts of the interface that is important to know. The other part is also the environment pane. So this right here on the top right is where you get to see all the objects that, and variables that you've created. So anything you create, any graphs or scatter plots that, that you create or save to an object will all be shown here. So whenever you're coding and you make a bunch of objects and you wanna know which one, what all, all, all the objects that you've made, you can always refer back to this top right pane and to see all the variables that you created. So as an example, I'm going to create a, a variable, a vector called num1, where I'm going to just put some numbers, two, three, four, five. Right. And I run this, so control enter. Now you see here in this environment pane that I have, it's showing all the objects I've created. So in this case, I created a vector called num1, which contains the numbers one, two, three, four, five. So here it tells you the name of this object, and then it tells you what type of vector, it, the type of object it is. In this case, it's a collection of numbers, and it gives you a little preview of what's in it. So in this case, I have the numbers one, two, three, four, five. So anytime you create an object, it's gonna show up here, where it'll tell you the name, what type of object it is, and then what's give you a little preview of what's in it. So it's pretty useful if you ever wanna know what you created and what's in it. So especially when you create a, have multiple objects created at once. All right. And lastly, you have this extra pane right here, which in this case, it's a file explorer which is where you get to look at all the files that you created in your working directory, which for anyone who may not know what a working directory is, it's the folder that you're working in whenever you're doing an R project or a GitHub repository. So it's where you're pretty much running off of, like when you're running stuff. Oh yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ante. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's definitely our other commands that you can run that you can use on your keyboard to run the code, but that we'll get into, but thank you. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, so you have this pane right here, which allows you to look at all the files that are in your working directory. So in this case, all I have is just test script in this R project. And it's useful if you created a bunch of R scripts and you wanna see what's in this folder. So in this case, I just have test script right now in this folder. All right, so that's just a general overview of the R interface. Just a little bit about what it looks like and what each pane is used for. So does that, does that make sense? Okay. All right. So moving on, um, we have the R console, which we talked about earlier. So now that we kind of got a sense of the the interface, let's go into a little, little bit more detail about different parts of just basic workflow, just coding in general. So one of the places that which you can run code is the console. So in general, almost everything you do in R is a bunch of commands. All these instructions that you pass to R that it will then run and then execute and then create all kinds of output. So anything you do in the R console everything you run will instruct R to do something with it based on the instructions and then print the result out. So you saw earlier that when I typed one plus four, it gives out five. Basically I'm telling R run this and get me the result of this. So in this case, one plus four is five or create this object right here, create a vector with all these numbers and it runs it. So some commands you run, it will produce an output and some commands that run, it will just execute and not return output. So this is a place for you to run commands. All right, 
in more detail. One of the cool things about R is it has some predefined objects. Basically, these are objects that are already created by R that you can use. So a good example is pi. So there's a variable in R called pi, which is the number 3.14, and there's a lot of different decimals after that. A really famous number in math, though, so, which you can access by typing pi. So if I go to the R console and I type pi, so spell lowercase p, lowercase i, you will get the number 3.141593. So this is a, a constant. This is a, a an object that's built into R that you can access. And there certainly are other examples of objects that R already has that you could use that are pretty useful. One of them being a collection of letters. So if I just run the command letters, it will give me all the lowercase letters in the alphabet. So it's useful if you're trying to run some kind of code that involves looking at different letters of the alphabet. And instead of having to create a vector with all these letters from A to Z, you can already use the this object letters that R already has to get all these letters of the alphabet. So these are just some examples of some objects that R already has that you can use and not have to build yourself. There certainly are a lot more objects that already exist in R, but these are just some examples just to show you that there's some objects that R already has built in that you can use right away without having to build it yourself. So if you're interested, um, there's some documentation in that you can look up, which I'm going to put down right here, which will give you a list of all the constant that R has. So yeah, I'm going to put it, put it in the chat. So this is some documentation in R that will show you some a list of all the constants that R has that you can access, where you have the pi and letters, and you also have month and capital letters. So pretty useful if you're interested in looking to more objects or constants that R already has. Sure. Right. Moving on. So any, so any command that you type in R will cause it to print out something. So now print out can mean many different things. Like with that example with one plus four, it printed out the result, which is one plus four is five. But printing out depends on the kind of function that you're using or function or command that you're running. So if, as an example, you have the ggplot2 package right here. And here you're loading one of the data sets that's built into the package, which is diamonds, which is this data set with all these different diamonds where you have columns like the carrot, the cut, the color, and the clarity, and all of that. Where if I were to run this in R, so ggplot2, and then two colons, and then diamonds, it'll give me a preview of this giant data set that has all these different pieces of data about these different diamonds and different characteristics of it, such as the color, the clarity, the depth, and the price. So that's just an example of how printing things out may vary depending on the command. So in this case, whenever you type the name of a data set, it will just print you a preview of the data set. It won't give you the whole data set, but it'll show you a preview of it, like maybe a couple of rows where it tells you the columns, what type of column it is. So in this case, it's double, meaning that these are all decimals. And then all these, it also tells you about just how many other rows there are. And it gives you the first 10 rows. Whereas for something like letters, it just prints out all, all the um, elements in this vector, in this case, all the lowercase letters in the alphabet. So printing out depends on the command that you're running and also what function or object that you're putting into the console. Yeah. All right. So moving on. So we have, so as a little caveat, I know I've mentioned earlier that when you type something out as a command, it's basically telling the console to run, to print out something. But really what 
it's actually doing is it's that when you pass any kind of command, you're basically telling the console to evaluate it, basically run these instructions and print something out as an example. So, so as is in this example, we have the command cos and then pi. Basically, we're telling the console, get the cosine of pi. So it's just a trigonometric function that is, is that some of you might be familiar with. And it'll get you the cosine of pi, which is 3.14, and it'll print out the result, which is negative one. And as I mentioned before, you can also use R as a calculator too. So you can run some calculations such as multiplication. So as an example, you can do addition, like one plus four is five. You, gotta, you also do three minus one, subtraction. So three minus one is two. You also multiply two, three times five times three, that's 45. And you also divide too. So five divided by 10. So using that, that slash for division. And also, you can also do the power. So five square or five times itself, two times. So, so five and then the two asterisks and then two, that's 25. So five square or five times five. So that's just one neat little thing you can do with R. Use it like a calculator. So pretty useful. All right, so as I kind of mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about assigning names. So let's say you want to take certain pieces of information and you want to save it in an object. So sometimes when you're running commands, you don't want to just print out the result. You also may want to save that result to an object, especially if you want to reuse that information for somewhere in the code. So the way they do that is that you first type out the value that you want, and then you use the assignment arrow key right here to store it in a variable. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lydia. Yeah, so as mentioned in the comments, you can also do five and then that kind of up arrow. It's in the on your keyboard. And then do five, two, and then that should give you 25 as well. So they're both give you the same result. They're just different ways of typing it out. Yeah. You can also do the double asterisks. They both work, though. so thank you. Yeah, so that's another way you can do get do powers, yeah. Anyway, so when you create um, object, you can use the assignment arrow, the sort of like the, the less than sign and then the, the hyphen. It's basically telling R that you want to set this you want this value right here, two times pi, and you want to store it in this variable called tau. So that would look something like this. So let's say we have tau, and then you do the less than sign, and then the hyphen, and then you type two times pi, which will tell R, I want the result of two times pi, and I want to store it in tau. So if I press enter, now you can see here on this environment pane, you can see here, now we have a new variable called tau, which is the result of two times pi. Oops, Oops hold on one second. And now for some of you who may have programmed in other languages, I imagine when you're seeing this, you might be familiar with how in a lot of programming language like Python or even Java, they usually use the equal sign for assignment. And you can do that too. Say, if I were to, go back here and I type tau equals two times pi, I still get the same result. It still, it still works just as well when you use the, this assignment operator here with the less than and the hyphen. They still work. However, the thing about assignment is that the equal sign is something that is usually used in R for mathematical equality. So often, so because that it's used in that way, where it's something along the lines of, so of say, for example, let's say you're trying to evaluate, check if something is equal to this, like a say an inequality of some kind. Since we use the equal sign for situations like that, 
we typically like to separate usage by having a different operator to create objects with. So not that you can't use the equal sign to create objects, but generally just to make it less confusing, we like to have separate operators for different things. So generally, we, in most cases, you would typically use this assignment operator with the less than the hyphen to create object assignments. So, and I imagine that when you're doing these assignment statements, it can get a little bit repetitive having to type out this symbol over and over again. So one of the fastest way you can type out this assignment operator is to use the alt minus on your, know, so go on your keyboard, press alt minus at the same time, and it'll automatically create an assignment operator for you. So it's a really fast way if you want to create assignment statements without having to type out the operator. So if I do it again, tau, and then the alt um, minus, and then two times pi, there you go. So that's just another way to do things faster where you can just use the keyboard shortcut to get the assignment operator. And yes, as I mentioned before, any objects you make will go onto the environment panel. So you saw when I typed this assignment statement, automatically created the variable tau and tells you what's in it. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, this is, no, definitely. Like, this is my first time actually knowing about that for sure. So, yeah, so just knowing that there's a keyboard shortcut for that actually makes things a lot faster. <laughs> okay. Assignment and signing and printing. So now that we have an idea about assigning and print, assigning, making assignment statements, let's go in a little bit more detail about that. So generally by default, when you make an assignment, the result of that evaluation is not printed in the console. So you saw earlier when I made tau, set tau equal to two pi times pi, it doesn't print out what's in tau. However, if you want it to not only make that assignment statement, but also print out the, the what's in that object, you can write that same command, just do what you did before, except wrap that command in parentheses, just wrap it in parentheses, which will cause it to make an assignment statement and print out what's in that object. So let's do it again. So, so you go down here, let's go, let's type. So let's do an open parentheses and you can see how R already provides the closing parentheses. So inside this parentheses, tau times two, equals two times pi, which should get you, oops. There you have it. You still have tau. And now you also see what's in tau. So it's the result of two times pi, which is 6.283185. So it's useful when you want to, when you're making a complicated assignment statement where there's a lot of calculations going on and you want to see also what's in it. So pretty useful tool when you're making assignment statements. Yeah. Okay, so code. So this is just a little side note. So when it comes to coding, one of the tips that is best that I found pretty helpful is saying what you're doing out loud. That way it helps you kind of remember what you're doing and also kind of keep you focused when you're writing your code. So when you're reading these assignment statements, a way to think of it is that when you look at this assignment operator, think of it as equal to get. So when you see this command, tau assigned to assi assignment operator two times pi, you would read that as tau gets two times pi. So just a way to help you read it, especially when you're trying to explain code to other people. All right, so while, while we've, as we've seen earlier, you learn a lot about how to make assignment statements and how to make variables, and as well as just knowing the interface of R. Now, while it's great that you can make all these variables, one of the most important things that important to be aware of when you're making objects is that 
there are certain rules that you should you have to follow when you're making names, as well as a couple of suggestions on how to rate, make good names for your variables. And that's probably definitely one of the biggest challenges when it comes to making objects, how to come up with a good name. As generally when you're working in some kind of organization or in a team, it helps to have rules for how you make the names. That way, everyone's on the same page and also it helps you understand each object and what purpose does it serve. So when it comes to names, there are a couple of basic rules that you should follow. That are, that are basically the certain names that are allowed in R. So when, when you're making names, they can only have letters, numbers, the underscore, and the period. So that's generally the basic rules with names in R. As otherwise, if you type, you know, any anything that's not a letter, number, underscore, or period, you'll get an error. And also another note, R is case sensitive. So if you misspell a single letter, it will throw an error. So as an example, let's say I want to look print out the variable tau. Let's say I accidentally spell it with the lower uppercase T. So tau. Oh wait, oops. Well, R has this kind of autocorrecting, so let me work around it. So if I type tau, but I misspell something or I add something to it, you can see that it'll throw an error because there's no such object like called tau with a uppercase T. So you can see here, spelling is very important when you're trying to call a variable that, or object that you already created. So when it comes to situations, it's important to make sure that it's spelled correctly and in the exact case, whether it's upper or lower, and that you have exactly all the characters that are used in the named objects. Object. So yeah, just an important thing when you're coding as R can't read your mind and know what you want. So it's important to be specific and make sure that the spelling is correct. And just with that rules aside, there are also a couple of suggestions when it comes to code, when right, making good object names. These aren't really hard rules per se, but these are some helpful tips that you can consider when you're making variable names. One of those tips is that when you're making objects, you wanna be come up with good names that help explain what the object is for and what's in it. So it's okay to have long names as much as you like. The point is, you know, have as much, you know, words that you need in order to explain what's in it. So names like student item data, num students, and these are just some examples of some good names that tell the person reading your code or even when you're reviewing your code, what that object is for, what's in it, and what you can do with it. And an extra, and also as an extra note, when you're making variable object names, it's important that you use lowercase by default. And then you have like, say, the underscore as a separate, especially when you have a variable object name with multiple words. It makes it easier to read. And also it's less, it, it's, um, it let, it's, it's much more harder to mess up because if you have say a variable name, object name, where there's different cases at different words, it can be hard to keep track of, especially when you have large or long object names. So, so these aren't like hard rules, but these are some things that are very helpful to follow to make really good object names for your, for any objects that you make. Okay, moving forward. So now that we've talked a lot about objects and how to name things and different parts of the R interface and a little bit about what you can do in R in the console. Mm -hmm. And now let's get to probably one important function object that, that you should be aware of, and that is functions. So functions in R is kind of like a, like a box where you, you put in some information and then it will do something with that information and then it'll print out something or it'll give you something in return. It's kind of like um, when you point, like when you put a coin in a slot machine into like a sort of like a vending machine and then something comes out, it's kind of like that. It takes 
information from you, something from you, it does something with it, and then it gives you, gives out something. So a function, so it's sort of like a, it's like a box that takes an input and returns output. And these functions can take one or two or zero or even a bunch of objects as input. So, and whenever you call a function, you can specify values or arguments for the inputs. And when you run these function calls, it'll give you whatever result comes out of that function. So as an example, earlier I showed you the, the built-in constant letters, which is a collection of all the lowercase letters in the alphabet. And let's say we want to use the function length, for example. So I go to R and I type length and I type letters. And I run that command, not a second, run that command. It returns the number 26, which is the number of lowercase letters in the alphabet, letters in the alphabet, or, or basically in this case, the number of elements in this object right here. As, as you remember, letters is a vector containing all the lowercase letters in the alphabet, and there are 26 of them. So in a sense, it's a vector of 26 characters in it. So, and from that, you can figure out that length is a function that gives you how big an object is, or if you're passing in vectors, how many elements are there in that vector? So that's just an example of how functions work and how they, how they operate. There's also another example where n row, which basically is a function that tells you how many rows are there in a data set or like in a data frame or object that you're passing in that usually contain, is how you store data. So if I were to run this command, n row, so n row, ggplot2, diamonds, it'll, it'll tell you how many rows there are. So as earlier, you saw a preview with 10 rows and then 5,930 ro rows that are not shown yet. And, and here, when you run this command, it tells you the number of rows, which is 53,940 rows. So these, so that's just some examples of some of the fu ways functions work in R. Next up, um, one thing to know about functions is that the inputs or basically the arguments you pass into functions or all have names, which are parameters, basically the names of the arguments that you can pass in, pass in information to. And when, you, when you're making function calls, you can also type out the name of the argument and then make an assignment statement where you set it equal to the value that you want it to be. So a way to demonstrate, let's look at the function sequence, which if you run it, it will return a sequence of numbers from this number to that number. So in this case, so you have sequence. So you have sequence. And the, the thing about this sequence is that it has a bunch of arguments. So you have the argument from, which allows you to specify where you want the sequence of, of numbers to start at. So in this case, I want the sequence of numbers to start at one. And two, which allows you to specify where do you want the sequence of numbers to stop at? So let's say 10. So I want a sequence of numbers from one to 10. And if I run it, it'll give me a sequence of numbers that are incremented by one from one to 10. So one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10. So that's just an example of how you can make function calls where you can specify the parameters and also the values you want to pass in it and then run it and then it'll execute. Now, usually when you're making function calls, as I showed you with the, previously when I ran length on letters, you don't have to keep the order the, the same way 
same way, as long as you specify the arguments. So earlier I showed you the function call for sequence where I had the argument from equals one first, and then also the argument two equals 10 after that. So when, you, when you're able to name your arguments and set the values to it, you don't have to do it in that order. You can maybe switch the order. So, so with that sequence thing again, I can run it again and then switch up the order of the arguments. So as long as I name them. So two is 10, from is one, and I run it, you still get the same result. I just switched the order of the arguments. So instead of the from statement being first, now I put the to statement first. So any questions? Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, by argument. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out. So sequence, um, which this is not in the book, but sequence also has a by argument, which allows you to specify how much do you want to increment by. So going back to that same example, two equals 10. And there's also a by argument, which allows you to specify how much you want to increment. By default, it's one, which means to go to the next number, it goes by plus one. So from one, I go to two, from two plus one goes to the three. I can change it where instead of going by one, I can go by two. So I can do this. And you see here, I have this sequence where I go to the next number by two. So one plus two is three. And then the next number five is three plus two. And then it stops at nine because nine plus two is 11, which is greater than 10. So it doesn't go after that. Yeah. Oh yeah, odd numbers, yes. So this is a sequence of odd numbers. Sure. So yeah, that's some examples of how you can do function calls. So if you ever are confused about functions or you wanna know what arguments that you can pass to a, um, a function, especially the built-in ones or ones from packages like ggplot, one way to get some help is you can press the, you can type question mark and then the name of the function and then press enter. And what it'll do is that it will load some documentation in this other pane right here, where it'll tell you what this function does, the, um, the library that it comes from up here. And then it'll give you some examples. Usually they give you some examples on how to use it. And then it tells you the list of arguments right here. Like what arguments can you pass into it? And then this is just some technical details that you can read up if you're interested in knowing about how they created that function. But so that's just an option that you can use in case that you want to use certain functions and you want to know how to use it or what it, what's it doing. So that's definitely something you could do, look at there. All right, so we talked a little bit about functions. Um, lastly, there are lots of different tools and features that of our studio that you can use that really help enhance the coding experience, when, especially when you're writing all these scripts and creating different plots and objects and so on. So I know it says explore, but I can show you a couple of them just to get a sense. So there certainly are a lot more, but that you're free to play around with, but these are some Use interesting ones that are worth looking into. So one of them is the tab autocomplete. So you may remember earlier that I said that how um, that with that you can have long variable names. And I imagine one issue that comes up is that what if it's very long that it's very time consuming to type out. So one of the ways you can work around it is that you can type the first couple letters of that very long of that object. So in this example, I have this vector num1, which is um, a vector of numbers from one to five. And if I, if I type the first couple letters of that object's name, and then I press tab on the keyboard, it'll, it will load up this menu where I can pick a list of objects that I would like to get the name for. So in this case, I can scroll down or use the arrow keys to go up and down. 
So, so in this case, find the variable or object that you want to type out. And then once you make your selection, press enter. And there you ha have it. It completes the, the variable name for you, object name for you. So that's a, one thing you can do if you want to speed things up, especially if you have long variable names. Yeah, so just type the first couple of letters, press tab on your keyboard, and then pick the variable that you want to type out in the in the menu. And then once you make your selection, press enter and it'll type and it'll complete it for you. Yeah. All right. Another feature is the up arrow to see the console history. So while I did say that every time you exit R Studio or exit the console, it will erase everything that you typed out. You can, while you're still in R, the console session, you can you access old commands from your R, that you've typed in previously in our console. So if I go back to my console and I press the up arrow key on the keyboard, I can look at all the commands that I've typed already in the console. So you see I have num1, sequence, all these different commands I've typed in so far in the our console session. And this is useful if you we use if you want to reuse commands that you typed out, but you don't want to have to type it out again. So in this case, let's say I want to look at letters. So I just go up arrow key, or I can go down with the arrow key just to go back down, find the command I want to use again, and then press enter, and then you get your result. So another pretty useful feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this one is also something I kind of talked about earlier where if you type out a variable, oh yeah, our, let's see if it works in, that's a good question, let's start out, so. Oh yeah, it actually works in the R scripting environment. So if you have an object that you wanna type out, but you don't wanna type it out, you can auto-complete in there too. So type the first couple letters, go down this menu, find the variable you want, and then press enter. Yeah, so it, it works in the console and in the scripting environment. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Okay, and let's see what else. So I know I've talked a lot about R shortcuts and I know there's definitely are tons of them. Some of them I showed you through this, um, this session, but if you ever want to know all the shortcuts are the keyboard shortcuts that you can use in R, one option you can use is to go to your keyboard and press Alt, Shift and K at the same time. So Alt, Shift, K. And you see here you have this huge window that shows you all these sh keyboard shortcuts that you can use. And you have different categories too, like tabs, short source navigation, and so on, where you get all a list of all these different keyboard shortcuts for different purposes right here. So there's definitely are a lot and it's probably beyond what I can cover in the session, but these are just some keyboard shortcuts that you can use when you're coding, you know, as a way to make things faster, sure. Now to access this keyboard reference, keyboard shortcuts reference, you can also go down to help right here, up here, click on that, and then go down to keyboard shortcuts help. So that's another way you can access it. So in case you forgot the keyboard shortcut for the reference sheet, you can also go down to help, and then keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, so pretty neat feature. And then lastly, there's also the Alt Command down arrow. So if you're in your scripting page or in your markdown or even your Quarto document, if you press Alt Command and then go down, hold on, that's interesting.
Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Let's see here. So, yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, so it kind of. Yeah, that one I'll have to check into for sure. But I don't know what's up with my R Studio, but yeah, it's an interesting command that you can try out in your R Studio for sure. But other than that, um, hopefully um, this session is very helpful and that by the end of this, you kind of learned the basics of how to do basic workflow in R. I mean, we talked about how to make functions, how to make assignment statements, how, what different parts of the interface are for, as well as some interesting features that can help enhance your, your coding as you work in the console environment or the scripting environment, as well as making it, you know, making your coding more effective when it comes to making variable names and typing them out and keeping track of the objects that you created. So that said, um, that's the end of this session. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and hopefully you all, I'll, you all stay tuned for the next book club next week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. This is great, like super informative. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions or anything? Okay. This is great. <laughs> I learned so much. <laughs> all right. But yeah. So I guess I will see you all again next week as we go over chapter four data 